Welcome back to Knowing the Truth with Pastor Kevin Bowling. Information regarding the resources referenced on today's program can be found at www.knowingthetruth.org. Now here to continue with today's program is Pastor Kevin Bowling. Hey, I was reading in a recent article that appeared in, um, let's see, christianpost.com. The date of this article was in September of this year, but it was an article that says this. As the, the headline says, Stephen Hawkins confirms atheist beliefs. And then it says, uh, gives a quote from him. It says, there is no God, the physicist says. Um, in the article, it goes on then to say Stephen Hawking's a British physicist and a best-selling author famed for his work on time and space theory while confined to a wheelchair, answers questions during an interview in Orlando, Florida, uh, April 25th, 2007. And then it goes on to talk about uh, some of the things that were co- um, were uh, th- that's a, a picture that was there in the article referring to him answering these questions. But even more recently, in El Mundo newspaper, they asked him questions about uh, whether or not he believed in God. And it says this, renowned physicist Stephen Hawkins recently confirmed that he is an atheist who believes in science rather than God. Quote, before we understood science, it was natural to believe that God created the universe. But now, science offers a more convincing explanation, Hawkins said. Well, is that true? Does science really offer a more convincing uh, explanation than what we see in the revealed revelation from Almighty God in both the general revelation all around us and, of course, the special revelation that we see? And is it also true that uh, the Bible is at odds with science? Are the two things completely juxtaposed to each other? Well, that's a question that I wanted to ask our guest on the program today. Our guest is Dr. Joe Francis. He's the chairperson in the Department of uh, Biological and Physical Sciences and the Department of Mathematics at, uh, and the professor of uh, biological sciences um, at uh, the Masters College. Their website is www.masters.edu. And I wanted to ask him to comment, if he would, about this uh, statement that was made by Stephen Hawkins and also then to talk with us for a few moments about what is the the true foundation for science? Uh, what does he teach his students there at Masters, and how can we think through this in a biblical way? Joe, welcome back to the to the Knowing the Truth radio program today. Yes, it's great. It's great to be here. Uh, let me let me start um, by saying Stephen Hawking is a brilliant uh, scientist. He's a a great writer. I think um, some of the not all scientists are good communicators, but those that uh, often become popular and well read are are good writers, and that's to his his credit. There's a lot of questions there, so let's just start with the issue of science and faith. And I think your questions beg the larger question of authority. Mm. Um, what what is our authority for truth? And uh, of course, that was. Um, the question asked of, of Jesus, and it's in the Bible, what is truth, and, and and how does science relate to that? And simply put, I think many scientists agree that science is a method. It's a way of knowing about um, the physical world around us. And because it's a way of knowing, and it's based on human activity and the human mind, it is subject to all the foibles of humanity. And um we we and through science we even scientists will say we can predict things based on what we see but it's really hard to know what truth is because that's a a, a bigger question than science so to rebut some of uh, Stephen Hawking's words there many scientists don't take science as a final authority they realize that it's a way of knowing and it involves prediction it involves a lot of failure uh, it, it, it is a successful um, entity, though, because it has brought us a lot of things in technology, like our phones and uh, those things, we, little computers we now carry around in our pocket. It's a successful way of knowing. It's a successful uh, entity, but it has real, real limits. And 
there would be scientists of Stephen Hawking's stature, like Thomas Nagel at New York University, who would say, you know, science can't tell us everything. And so to say that science replaces God, uh, when the Christian view of God is that he is all-knowledgeable, is not a is not a good comparison, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I would say that many scientists would say, you know, you're comparing apples and oranges there. Mm-hmm. Um, and let me just say, Stephen Hawking's prediction that there is no God or belief that there is no God, I think is recent in his writing. If you go back and look at his writings over the last uh, 20 years, uh, he was married to a his first wife was a believer. Uh, I don't think he ruled out God in those uh, early days of his career. It's only been the last couple of years where he has said there is no God, and he bases it on the idea of cosmology and physics. Cosmology is the study of the universe and its origin. That um, actually comes from a study of these things called black holes, which suck gravity into them and light. And he says at the, the bottom of a black hole, there is no time. And so he's basing this on Einstein's work, too. Einstein said, you know, there's a relationship between time, matter, and energy. And we believe that to be true in science. There's, there's, there's that, that, that's backed up, there's a relationship. And so what Hawking has found out is that in these black holes, there seems to be a reversal of things down to a concentrated entity. Um, and time, and his prediction is when they're concentrated at a small level, you start losing energy, and you start losing um, matter, and you're going to start losing time, or time will come to an end. His idea is if there's no time, there can't be anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's an interesting concept. We can talk about the, the biblical issues involved there, too. Well, Dr. Frazier, is it is it a false dichotomy that he sets up here? It's a dichotomy that we hear so often today, but the idea between uh, faith and science— or, you know, as he's putting here, God and science. Um, is that a false dichotomy? Is, are Christians really to be at odds with science in that way? Or do they even position themselves to be at odds at, with science in that way? It's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, for decades and maybe even centuries, there's been a rumor that faith and science are there's some great war. But if you look at the historians of science, who I find some of them to be very honest, uh, say there has been no war. Uh, There has been no big battle between science and faith. Dan Brown has written a book about that, Angels and Demons, and pretty much uh, it's it's, uh, a lot of the storyline is false. Uh, There hasn't been a great battle. In fact, if you go back and look at the history of science, we can trace it back to Greek culture, Arab culture, uh, Hebrew culture, and and we and we find a lot of uh, secularism in the early days of science as people uh, said well you know we can know more about nature by reasoning through it but then but those those ancient uh teachers and philosophers when they looked at science they really didn't know what to do with it they thought it was some kind of mental activity that would uh lead them to some kind of nirvana and it wasn't science all the successes in science really can be traced back to when the scientific revolution in the 15th and 16th century won. And what we find at the heart of the scientific revolution is Christianity. Mm-hmm. We find Christians like Christians like Isaac Newton saying, there must be order in the universe, I'm going to try to find that. And so Isaac Newton is considered to be one of the greatest scientists of all times. He was a believer. He had a little bit some mixed up views about the deity of Christ and so on, but he, he had a biblical basis for his views. And so science, it, it's a misportrayal to say science and faith are totally at odds with one another, and it's not so historically. What we do though, find today, though, are a lot of scientific theories, especially in this area of cosmology, that are at odds with, with the Bible. Uh, but it's, it's, you've got to look at each point. So, for instance, let's take the Big Bang. Uh, Stephen Hawking has worked on that idea that that's, that theory says there was a beginning. And what does the Bible say? There is a beginning. Mm-hmm. But when you look when you look at the Big Bang, though, other things don't line up. So, for instance, it takes a billion years to make one carbon atom after the Big Bang, because you need stars and you need heat and you need all these things. The Bible says carbon was made in the first week. How do we know that? Because humans and living things are made out of carbon, and we were made in on um, you know on those early days of creation, that first week. 
uh, or later days of that first week. So we know that carbon was already there, and that doesn't line up. So the order doesn't line up. So as Christians, we're not afraid of science. There is no great battle between science and faith, but there are scientific theories that don't line up with Scripture. And there's where we can be um, discerning. We need to be discerning because when, when you look at when you look at, at I would claim there is a biblical basis for science mm-hmm. because if science is a way of observing, we find those principles in the Bible. We find um, Moses as he led the Israelites uh, to the Promised Land. Just before he goes in the Promised Land, he's worried about them getting to the Promised Land, and he says he doesn't give them any kind of four spiritual laws. He basically says, "Do you remember what God did? Do you remember?" what he did in the sky. Do you remember the manna? Did you remember hearing that? Did you remember seeing that? It's so basically what the Bible is saying. You can trust your senses to a, at a point that God uh, allows you to see things in this world and see physical things, even demonstrating himself. That is science. That's part of science. It's part of Romans 1, too, where it says that uh, we're, we're without excuse by not knowing about God, by the power he demonstrates in nature. So science in that way I think it's a gift from God, mm-hmm. but because because it's done by humans who are fallible, we're likely to make mistakes. And so I think Stephen Hawking has done some great things, but when it comes to what was there in the beginning, he's, he's doing the right thing by science is pointing him back to the beginning. That's what Romans 1 says. You see power in nature. Science is pointing him back to the beginning, but then instead of postulating God, which he knows to be true, Romans 1 says, we know that's in our heart. He says there is no God. Mm-hmm. And so um, to say, to sum up, science, I believe, is a gift from God, properly done in its, in its proper perspective, in the authority of Scripture. Uh, it can be a very useful tool mm-hmm. to study nature, and it should ultimately point us back to God. And I believe, again, according to Romans 1, that Stephen Hawking knows in his heart there is a God, but he's denying it. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, uh, Dr. Francis. Do you then uh, practice more of a presuppositional apologetic, and for our listening audience, you know, that uh, you take it as a given, as the Scripture says, that God is, and that those that we're speaking to know that God is, because of, as you referred to, Romans chapter 1 or Psalm 19 and so forth, uh, that God is, do you do you then practice more of a presuppositional apologetic rather than going about uh, trying to prove the existence of God? Uh, what does that look like in your in your everyday uh, efforts of sharing the gospel message? Oh yes, uh, yeah. I, I think what's instructive here, as I was thinking about Stephen Hawking's idea that there's no God because at some point there's no time. It, there's those great passages in Revelation where the Lord says he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, over and over. And then in Genesis 1, so so he is part of time as we know it, uh, and probably began it if it had a beginning. Uh, and probably, you know, Everything had a beginning from God, so we have to say it does. But also in Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God. It doesn't say in the beginning, God was born. In the beginning, God created himself. In the beginning, something created God. It said, in the beginning, God. The best we can tell from Scripture is God is, like you said, yes. has always been. He either transcends time, or if time is something eternal that he made, he's always been part of it. Uh, I think Scripture uh, leads to that, and I think it's one of the greatest answers we have to Stephen Hawking, is, is to say, how does he know mm-hmm. there's something out how does he know there's not something outside of time? And how does he know that God wasn't there when he started time? He tried to not, you know, prove a negative, so to speak. So yes, uh, and then so in, in, as a scientist, that's my presupposition more than any kind of evidentialism that God exists. And he said, he says in Genesis, Genesis one one provides uh, a great foundation for science. So why don't we go there? Genesis one one. So so. In science, because it's a man-made, because it's done by men as a gift from God, we look around and make observations, and then we have to assume certain things. The best things that the the best that scientists can say about the physical world, it is made of atoms, Mm -hmm. small things. And if you look at an atom really, really close in a super microscope, it's full of empty space. 
Hmm. So the best thing they can say is, we're all made of things that are full of empty space. <laughs> <laughs> and so they have to assume that reality exists, even though they're, it's, the data is telling them we're mostly empty space. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. What he is saying is, physical reality exists. Mm -hmm. So what's beautiful about this is God is saying, the presuppositions of science, the assumptions of science that reality exists, are declared to be true by the Bible. Mm -hmm. That provides a wonderful foundation for science. So now I don't have to worry about reality exists. I know it exists. And now I can go study how uh, to make a watch. I can study how to make a car. I can study how to make an iPhone. And I don't have to worry about those great questions that's, that's been solved, that reality exists. So that provides a wonderful foundation for science, uh, that God declares this reality to exist. Mm -hmm. Science cannot even prove that. Because science cannot ultimately prove that reality exists. When uh, science then uh, attempts to, or there are some folks in science, now the, more of the pseudoscience that I'm talking about today, not true science, but when, uh, when they uh, assume then to take it upon themselves to speak about origins and about what took place in the beginning, since true science is based upon observation and the ability to reproduce something in the laboratory, and they're not able to observe what happened in the beginning or to reproduce it in a laboratory, are they really speaking outside their jurisdiction? Are they have the mission creep? Has the have they gone into realms that they really have no business uh, commenting on? Yes, to to a degree, <laughs> to a degree. Let me let me try to explain this. Um, yes, the science is based as a human activity. Therefore, you need a science uh, human observer. Therefore, the Big Bang. We're we're, we're where creation and evolutionists or cosmolo evolutionary cosmologists agree is that there was a time when there was no human observer. Mm -hmm. Both those world views, part of those world views, agree with that. There was no human observer. Then we have to say science can only speculate. But it's okay. We, as a creationist, I want science to be allowed to do some speculation because we also have something called creation geology, mm -hmm. where we look at fossils. And we say that those fossils, uh, a lot of them look, look like they came, were buried quickly in sand by a flood. Now, I wasn't there, but I want to be able to make that prediction, too, so that I can show others that we can interpret the data within a reasonable framework. So science is limited. So I think the best way to say it is science is, is, is limited in what it can tell us and what kind of assurance it can give us. When there's no observer... We can only predict. Mm -hmm. As secular scientists or creationists, we can only predict. But I do want to allow some prediction because creationists are doing that also. But mm -hmm. I think what you're what you're saying and and showing is a lot of people go beyond prediction and say this is what is. So for Stephen Hawking to talk about a black hole, and we can't even it'll it'll take a million years for us to get a spaceship to a black hole and, and actually see it is really speculative. Mm -hmm. Is really speculative. It's it's not. Uh, as tried and true science as something we might do in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. But he can still predict. We'll allow him to predict. Where creationists are working is we want to make predictions also and show that our predictions are reasonable um, based on a biblical foundation. And that's what's exciting about being a Christian in science. Amen. When you talk about reasonable, uh, I think about what their statements really are compared to what our statements really are. Their statement uh, about the origin of all things is uh, nothing plus nothing equals something. Uh, there was nothing, yeah. and then nothing then produced something came out of it. I mean, that's a, that's a quite uh, uh, unrational uh, statement to, to make. It's, uh, it's ridiculous uh, on the surface. We believe there was something or somebody, God, and from him then flowed all things. So uh, put that way, I think, you know, we have a much more rational position. Additionally, um, with intelligent design— I find that they've got themselves in a real box here because the des uh, when we look at things more closely, you've talked about looking at things through the either through the microscope or through the telescope. Uh, in both cases, we see that there is tremendous level of design uh, that is evident. Now they say, 
to the point where they're saying, yes, there is the design, design, but the design came from aliens. And uh, yeah. when, when they start talking about little green men, I'm thinking, man, what are we intimidated about? We've got them exactly right. where we want them, right? Right. And, 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 and let me point out, let me synthesize what you said and go back to Stephen Hawking, because there's an important point we can make here. Mm-hmm. Stephen Hawking, um, you know, tries to... Uh, he tries to take advantage of the fact that if there's nothing, how can there be something? But you're right. Then something has to come from nothing, and that's mm-hmm. a problem. But here's what's interesting. He has to use design to make his argument. Mm-hmm. He has to use something analogous to design. He was uh, on a, a TV program where he showed, he tried to demonstrate that there is no God because time, at one point there was no time. And this television program called A Curiosity Question, they had a panel discussion of cosmologists almost on the level of Stephen Hawking. And one was named Paul Davies, and he is a great uh, cosmologist. And they turned to him and they said, what do you think about Stephen Hawking's theory that there is no God? He said, you know what? He, He pointed out a flaw. He said, Stephen Hawking has to use physical laws to make his prediction. And he wrote his book last night. He says... I can only make my prediction if I assume physical laws exist like gravity Mm. or the speed of light exist. Paul Davies says, where do those physical laws come from? You haven't solved the problem. You said there's nothing except your physical laws, and you have to have those physical laws there for this to work. Mm. Paul Davies said, there's room for God there. Mm. And he's he's probably an agnostic. And he criticized. And so that's, that's design right there, because what we find are these physical laws operating day by day, and, and they've operated in the near past, and they've operated in the distance past, and no one understands gravity yet today. Mm. We think there's a gravity particle, and no one's isolated it. We don't understand gravity, but we know it exists. That's beautiful design. We don't know why the moon stays in its exact orbit. And a few miles one way or the other would really mess up the tides on the earth and that sort of thing. There's design. I think Stephen Hawking has to use these physical laws, which are part of design and science, to explain there is no God. And Paul Davies says, where, where is your idea of design coming from? You know, where, mm-hmm. where are these physical laws coming from? It's a great rebuttal, and I would yes. like to hear his, his answer. They didn't, they didn't give him a chance to answer that. Yeah, they borrow capital from, uh, from those that believe in the, um, the scriptural viewpoint of, about origins. And so they seem to cross the line there and borrow capital from other, from other areas and try to implement that in their, uh, their theory that there is no God. Um, I th- think the bottom line is we're just down to the uh, a minute or so in the broadcast, but yes. let me ask you, uh, I would say then that Christians need not be intimidated by this whatsoever, right? Oh, oh no. No, no, we're instructed not to fear. We're not to fear man uh, and, and his ideas, and uh, we're not to condemn others either, but we can, as John MacArthur has said in the sermon, we can stand against anti-God ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the same time, at the same time, I like to work with atheists and others to show them that the ideas that they have are often consistent with someone searching for God. Mm -hmm. They want to know about nature. They they see power in nature. They see the thunderstorms. They see the floods. And that's what Romans 1 says. He demonstrates his power. So that's what I love about science is everyone can see, use science to see power around them. And Romans 1 says that will bring them to God. Mm-hmm. And they're without excuse. They're without excuse. Right. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Francis, for bringing this out, for uh, giving some commentary on the uh, Stephen Hawkins comments, but also talking to us a little bit about the idea of the uh, uh, the true foundation for science. We appreciate the work that you do there at Master's College. We appreciate Master's College and all that they stand for. So thank you so much for joining us on the Knowing the Truth radio program today. Thank you, Pastor. It's great to be part of it. Well, that was uh, Joe um, Joe Francis that we're speaking to, Dr. Joe Francis, as I was uh, mentioning early on. He's the chairperson in the Department of Biological and Physical Sciences and the Department of Mathematics 
Uh, he's a mathematics professor of uh, biological science, I think, at uh, Masters College. And so we're talking with him about uh, giving us some commentary on the statement that was made uh, recently by Stephen Hawkins, but even more so than that, uh, talking about the subject of science in general. You know, there's... Um, it's true in natural uh, revelation or general revelation that is called uh, the reason why it's called those two things is uh, it's in nature for one. So natural revelation and general revelation, meaning that it gives us general knowledge about the things of God. And in that, in the the environment all around us, even in the creation of ourselves, we can come to certain determinations about God, that God exists and that he is powerful and wise and so forth. And thankfully, the Lord also then gave to us something else. He gave us special revelation in his word. And because in general revelation, there is nothing, there's no redemptive quality of it there. There's nothing there speaking about how we can be brought back into a right relationship with God. But there is in special revelation. And so when we look at special revelation, i.e. God's word, we can see there about the person and work of the Redeemer, our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Both of them work hand in glove together, general revelation with special revelation. This is what God has provided for us to be able to know him and have a relationship with him. You want to find out more about Masters, go out to their website, www.masters.edu. That's www.masters.edu. You're listening to Knowing the Truth. To keep this ministry strong and coming your way, you can make a financial gift at knowingthetruth.org by clicking on the Donate button. You've been listening to Knowing the Truth with Pastor Kevin Bowling. Knowing the Truth is the outreach ministry of the Mountain Bridge Bible Fellowship located on Highway 25 in Traveler's Rest. For more information about the church and radio ministry, visit us on the web at knowingthetruth.org. The opinions expressed on today's program are those of the announcers, their guests, and callers and do not necessarily represent those of the staff and management of his radio network, the radio training network, or Clear Channel Communications.